During this global pandemic, I met Halan socially distanced at our offices in Washington, D.C. Let's, uh, let's go on inside. Halan is also an award-winning novelist, poet, and author. He's a professor of creative writing at a public university in nearby Virginia. His current nonfiction book is Chibok Girls, the Boko Haram Kidnappings and Islamist Militancy in Nigeria. What compelled you to write this? Because, I mean, you've written so much. Uh, I know this journalism background and you, maybe that was the itch, but uh, and also growing up there, maybe returning to an area you were familiar with. What, what was it that drew you to it? Um, so many things. But one of the most, um, I think, important factors that drove me to write the book. Um, I started hearing about the kidnappings when I was living in Germany. Um, in 2013, I went there for a fellowship and I was there for one year. Um, so the girls were taken in 2014 and I was hearing the news, you know, on the radio, on CNN. And I had been living outside Nigeria for about 10 years. And I was comparing this, you know, this Nigeria that I was seeing um, in news reports, um, comparing to the Nigeria that I knew when I was growing up, and it was totally different. And I was disturbed because, you know, it's, I feel like I'm an alien, or this like an alien land that I didn't know anything about. So I was wondering, you know, could this place have changed so much, you know, in this short time? Well, not short time, about 10 years, but could it have changed so much in this time? Um, and then, of course, the kidnapping happened in 2014. And I was saying to myself, these girls could be my sisters and my daughters because I'm from that part of the country. And, and I'm a writer. What could I do you know, to, to, to say something, you know, to kind of lend my voice to the discussion around this and to kind of um, make people aware of what's happening and to also kind of show people that you know, there's a history behind this. This just didn't happen because people were likening Boko Haram and that part of the country to, you know, ISIS and Syria. And I wanted to say, it's not exactly like this, <laughs> you know, because I was trying to be, you know, defensive um, and to say that it's not that bad, even though it was really bad. Halan grew up not far from Chibok, but traveling there in 2015 to research his book meant confronting head on the deep changes in his homeland. It's apparent from the very start of the book, and I think it kind of is this undercurrent throughout uh, there are dangers in this trip, though. Uh, talk to us about some of the the dangers that were present, how you tried to skirt around them. Uh, but when also, you know, I mean, there's I, I've been in kind of scary situations. There's a fear factor there, too. I mean, you have to think about your own mortality. Yeah. Talk to us about all of that. Yeah, there's an anecdote in the book about um, me going to IDP, internally displaced persons camps, <laughs> with uh, one of the sector commanders, he's a major, and he was giving me a tour. Um, I interviewed him, then he was taking me to these IDP camps. And the, the report was that there was a ransom, um, sorry, uh, bounty on his a head. bounty, yeah. thank you, a bounty on his head for like 50 million naira. So I was in this car with this guy who has this bounty on his head, and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? Um, so that's an example of one of the dangers, you know, that, you know, they were quite real at that time. And then traveling from Meiduguri to Chibok, they had just opened the road, but there were reports, um, so many reports of, you know, IEDs exploding um, by the sides, buried by Boko Haram by the sides of the road. Um, and of course, we saw dead bodies and things like that. And people were being kidnapped all the time when I was there, you know, carrying out my my interviews. Um, the day I left Meiduguri to go to Chibok, um, the very camp, IDP camp that we went to, um, there was a bomb explosion there. A lady came in with um, suicide, you know, vest and exploded. And about 50 people were killed. And my second return to Chibok, um, I went there just two days after bombers, suicide bombers had been to, to that place. And, and I describe it in my book, how they dressed, you know, like women, and they went and exploded a bomb um, where the military were stationed to distract them. Then one of them went into the, the town of Chibok and exploded another bomb in the, in the marketplace. So things were happening. It was, 
I think quite traumatic for me when I came back and I kind of looked back to, to where I had been, you know, and what had happened. And it's not just the, the bomb explosions and things like that. It's the awareness that, you know, this thing happened in this place. When you're traveling, you see all the schools, because that's one sure marker of their progress through these areas. They always destroy the schools. They set the schools on fire. So you go from village to village, from town to town, you see all the burnt down schools and homes and the bullet holes. And you tell yourself, yeah, this is, this is like a war front and I've been there and things could have happened to me, you know, but for the grace of God. And I came back and I was, yeah, I was telling my wife about it. <laughs> and she was like, why did you do, why did you go? Um, but yeah, the danger was real, scary. You get to Chibok, and uh, of course, you interviewed some of the people who were impacted. And I think this gets into scope. It's, it, the tentacles of what happened that day extend far beyond the girls who were abducted. Uh, obviously, it impacted the families. They're horrific, horrific. And in the book, I talk about um, people who died, parents who died immediately after their girls were taken. Um, some of them died from, you know, diseases, high blood pressure. Um, you know, psychological diseases. Um, so you can imagine your child. I'm a parent, I have two, two daughters, and I can imagine them being taken. Um, not just that they were taken, but you don't know where they were taken. You don't know what's happening to them. You don't know if they're alive or not. All you can do is to imagine your daughters in the hands of these killers. Um, they use them for, you know, prostitution, um, they use them as slaves. And then you have the leader of this group going on YouTube saying that I have your daughters. I'm going to marry them off, I'm going to sell them, I'm going to turn them into slaves. Imagine living with that every day. But some of the strongest um, parents who kind of manage to, to, to survive and to champion the, you know, the, the call for, um, to the government to, to to try and bring back the girls, actually were the mothers. Um, they would travel all over the country, um, giving interviews, um, going to the state house in Abuja, trying to meet with the president. And they formed this parent association, you know? Um, and they were, they were kind of continuing the fight. They refused to give up. And I think we have them to thank um, for, for the continuation of the fight and what's happening today that the government finally was paying attention um, to, to what happened is because of these mothers who formed these organizations and influenced a lot of government officials and individuals and NGOs, international NGOs, to really begin to pay attention to what, what happened in Chibok. Bring Back Our Girls is one of the parents' groups. They launched a social media campaign to raise awareness of the kidnappings, and the effort drew global attention. So, Hawan, one of the things we've talked about, well, we've talked about a lot, but one of the things we haven't talked about is girls. And you did interview some of the girls who were able to escape. And talk to us about sitting there and listening to their stories and, and what it was like. Um, so I talked to about three of them um, that escaped the night that they were taken because there were about 276 girls that were kidnapped that night and about 57 of them escaped that night. So I was able to talk to three of them. Um, and when they were taken, they were about 16 years old because they are just finishing their you know, secondary school, they're writing their final exams. And it's one thing that struck me is just how young you know, these girls were and how ordinary their dreams are. Um, I asked them, you know, what do you want to be? Um, some of them, they told me they want to be doctors, um, they want to be lawyers, and it's just sad, you know, watching them, um, talking to them, and remembering that their classmates are still in the forest, mm -hmm. and they may never, you know, realize their dreams or be what they always wanted to be. So it's just kind of sad. As a, as a father, as a parent, you know, I kind of imagine them as my daughters, and it's just heartbreaking. We have a Western perspective, how we see things through kind of our Western lens. And 
And you're unique because you live here in the West, but you're also from Nigeria. Talk to us about those different perspectives and how the story is seen and reported differently, or is it? Yeah. Um, one of the reasons why I decided to write the book is to kind of give a more historical context and to kind of educate the, the foreigner to, you know, why this thing happened the way it happened and what was going on. Um, because I saw a lot of coverage of the news, you know, on CNN um, and other BBC, you know, and it's just this brief mention, you know, and they just show these plays, you know, basically like, like I said, like Syria, you know, oh, there's this fighting, these people are killing themselves. But I wanted to just kind of make the non-Nigerian reader aware that, you know, this, there's more context to this. Um, it's not just people who kind of spontaneously just started shooting and killing each other. There's, there's a kind of history to it. You know, it's, it's about colonialism. Um, it's about democracy. Um, it's about what the country is trying to become. And my hope is to show that, you know, this is even as abnormal as it is, it's not too abnormal. You know, countries go through this. Nigeria actually went through a civil war. So um, I want to kind of liken this moment to the civil war, that it's just like another civil war. And countries have to go through this, especially countries that are trying to become democratic. They have to test each other. You know, they have to go through this stress test. And eventually, if they can come out stronger, um, then the country is going to be stronger for that. So I just kind of want to put that within the context of a country becoming what it hopes to become. Mohammed Youssef founded Boko Haram in 2002, attracting poor Muslim families in northern Nigeria at a time when Nigerians were disenchanted with their government. The whole economy of the area used to revolve around this huge lake called Lake Chad, um, where fishing activities were going on, um, smuggling, um, exporting things to Chad, to Cameroon and Niger, which are bordering the Borno state. Um, so when, when the lake started dwindling, it shrank to about 90% of its, 90% of it shrank in about 20 years. So the whole economy around the lake Chad kind of disappeared, opportunities disappeared. And the young people started migrating to the city, to Medugri. So you had this huge influx of young people with nothing to do, no education, no prospects. And there's this massive corruption in Abuja, the state cap the federal capital. You see politicians living ostentatiously and opportunities are reducing every day. So that kind of gave rise, among other factors, to this um, disaffection you know, among people. So when you have people like Mohammed Yusuf emerging and then preaching about opportunities and preaching against the government and saying that democracy is bad, um, Western education is bad, and I'm going to build this, you know, complex where people can come. And he was giving them microfinancing. Um, he was giving them food, free food. He was giving them places to, to sleep. So you had these people just coming to him, plus his charisma, you know, and preaching about life after this life, which is going to be plentiful and all that. You know, people were attracted to him. He was quite charismatic. So that's one, one of the reasons. So corruption, poverty, and so many other things kind of drew people to him. Final question for you. Yeah. What, what's it going to take to turn the corner on Boko Haram? Ah, Nigeria cannot do it alone. And we've seen a good example of that. Um, when they tried to ransom the girls, it didn't work. They had to partner with um, NGOs. And the Swiss government was very instrumental um, in, in negotiating between the militants and the Nigerian government. So Nigeria has to really reach out, and other governments will have to reach out to Nigeria to help them in this fight. Because it's a very international fight. Um, it's not just a Nigerian issue. This is a whole... Sahelian region, um, making up countries like Mali, um, Mauritania, Chad, Niger. The whole Sahel region is going through this now. You know, with the fall of Gaddafi in 2011, this whole area was opened to, to, to the incursion of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And the whole area is in this 
huge famine. Um, there's free movement of weapons and fighters going from country to country and basically overtaking the government. So it's a very international thing. And I think America should be interested in this. Um, Europe should be interested in this and give as much assistance as they can to, to these countries, not just Nigeria, but the whole Sahelian region. Hold on, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thank you. <laughs>